Welcome to module 11, lecture number 35. We are at the fag end of this uh, uh, course. This is the uh, module after which there is only one module left before we complete this course. Now, in this uh, session or rather in this module, we are going to discuss about uh, usability heuristics and testing. Usability heuristics plays a major role in audit of interfaces by experts. It provides a very fast and accurate way of finding the errors, finding the issues that may frustrate your users and leads to better design of interfaces. We would discuss about this in detail in this session. We are also going to discuss uh, about usability testing, the initial foundational aspects of usability testing, followed by a detailed uh, discussion on usability testing and the uh, experimental protocols in our subsequent module, which will be the last module for this course. So, let us begin. Now, what is heuristic evaluation? You know, heuristic evaluation was proposed by Jacob Nelson and Mollich in 1990 and further being improved by Nelson in 1994. Now, it is a usability engineering method for finding the usability problems in a user interface design, so that they can be attended to as a part of an iterative design process. Now, heuristic evaluation involves having a small set of evaluators examine the interface and judge its compliance with recognized usability principles, which are called as heuristics. Now, I would like to draw your attention here on the discussions that we had in during the earlier modules in this course, that we know that the user centered design process is iterative in nature. Focus on this aspect. Now, having been said this, what is important for us to comprehend here is that the focus is on identification of usability problems, so that a modified user interface design can be presented to whom? To your users. And these activities are carried out, are all part of your user centered design approach, when you have you know a concept which has been detailed out, evaluated, you have the wireframes done, you have the prototyping ready and then you go for identification of the uh, usability issues. At this stage, we are referring to conducting a heuristic evaluation. If you see here, the focus is on attending the usability issues that might exist in the interface due to some erroneous decisions, whatever it may be. But the important aspect here is that it needs to be attended, so that when the beta release phase happens, when the product is initially released in the market, these usability errors or issues can be addressed. Or rather we can say that the product gets released only when these issues, which might have occurred during the conceptualization have been addressed. And therefore, we say that it is iterative, because what you do is that once you go for a heuristic evaluation, say if you identify issues, you again come back to the stage, where you start focusing on the concept, redefining your wireframes, focusing on your prototype. And therefore, we say that it is a iterative design process. So, what we do here is, we involve a small set of evaluators, who examine the interface, 
based on some usability principles. We are going to discuss about these principles in this session in detail. Now, it is a process. So, heuristic evaluation is a process wherein usability experts, now I am using the term as experts, these are not simple uh, designers of any specialization or even any person doing it, no. These are people who are aware of the usability heuristics and therefore, we call them as experts. So, when experts use rules of thumb to measure the usability of user interfaces in independent walkthroughs. We have discussed in detail about cognitive walkthroughs. So, your experts are supposed to conduct walkthroughs and they use the rules of thumb or the heuristics to evaluate or identify the issues and then report those issues to the team. So, evaluators while going through the, while conducting and walkthrough uses established heuristics like the Nelson's and Mollich heuristics that we refer to as Nelson's heuristics and they reveal insights that can help the design team enhance product usability. Now, heuristic evaluation is very, very difficult if the focus is only on one evaluator. If you ask only one evaluator to or one expert rather to conduct a heuristic evaluation, it is going to be difficult because it is not possible for one person to identify all the problems that might exist in your interface. And therefore, it is a practice that you at least call four to five experts, different experts having experiences in working in different domain projects, in projects from different domains and therefore, they have perspectives which does not match with each other. So, it is a it's kind of heterogeneous group, these experts. You call at least four or five experts and then ask them to go for a walk through and use the heuristics to identify the issues with the interface. Now, if you use this approach, then probably it is possible that the effectiveness of this heuristic evaluation method improves a lot whenever you use this kind of multiple evaluators instead of only doing one evaluator based evaluation. Now, heuristic evaluation is performed by having each individual evaluator inspect the interface alone. Only after all evaluations have been completed are the evaluators allowed to communicate and have their findings aggregated. Now, this procedure is important in order to ensure independent and unbiased evaluations from each evaluator. The results of the evaluation can be recorded either as written reports from each of the evaluator or by having the evaluators verbalize their comments to an observer as they go through the interface. For you to note here is that if you have evaluators placed in a common space or work in tandem while they are doing the walk through, the verbalizations, the discussions might influence each other. So, it is ideal that you have the walkthroughs done individually by each evaluator, that you can record their insights, if you can ask them to re record or you can have one person who is observing to record for them, so that when they verbalize things get recorded. And later, when you have all the evaluators at, at a particular space, you can ask them to collaborate, discuss and debate on the issues that you have figured out. In that sense, when this kind of discussions and debates are encouraged, more or so what you will see is that issues that are probably much trivial are gradually neglected over issues which are more more important. And all these are done in relation to the heuristics, in relation to the way the heuristics are being interpreted by these evaluators. So, therefore, again I am repeat, repeating this statement that for you 
to conduct a heuristic evaluation, it is important that you identify an expert who has extensive experience in conducting heuristic evaluation at the same time is aware of how to interpret the heuristics based on the context that is being provided to the person. Now, let us understand how heuristic evaluation is different from user testing. Many a time people say that okay, I have seen in, in many projects they ask people, they ask their representative users to conduct a, to uh, have a walk through, uh, through the concepts and then they ask for issues and they present th th that result as the findings of the heuristic ev evaluation. Is that correct? The question is can you allow your users to behave as experts? and then whatever issues you identify with them represent those insights as findings for heuristic evaluation, can you do that? For that we need to understand the user test situation or the user testing scenario. Now, in a user test situation, the observer has the responsibility of interpreting the user's actions in order to infer how these actions are related to the usability issues in the design of the interface. So, this makes it possible to conduct user testing even if the users do not know anything about user interface design. Now, if you look at heuristic evaluation, in contrast to user testing, the responsibility for analyzing the user interface is placed with the evaluator in a heuristic evaluation session. So, a possible observer only needs to record the evaluator's comments about the interface, but does not need to interpret the evaluator's actions. The primary difference across user testing, which we often refer to as UTs and heuristics, heuristic evaluation is this. The activities of the user needs interpretation, while the activities of the expert does not need interpretation. This is the major difference between a user testing and a heuristic evaluation. See, heuristic evaluation is always done by experts and these experts evaluate your interface or will rather I can say will evaluate your interface while they are having a walk through of the concept based on and only based on the heuristics that we are going to discuss about. In contrast, the user who is absolutely has no idea about heuristics, who has absolutely no idea about user interface design guidelines or process, that person, your user is going to evaluate or verbalize his experiences based on his or her own expectations. That is the difference between user testing and heuristic evaluations. Now, to interpret why he is experiencing what he is experiencing, we need to have the observer who is observing the situation of a UT to interpret the, the observations of the user and he or she interprets the observation of the participant user from the perspective of a user interface design guidelines. That absolutely is not required when you are working with experts in heuristic evaluation sessions. That is the primary difference between a UT and a heuristic evaluation. So, you must understand this difference, so that clearly when, I, when you are working with users, you realize what is the essence of working with users, because you need to interpret their experiences, their insight from the perspective of UI design guidelines while you are not supposed to, essentially you are not supposed to do that while you are working with evaluators, because they 
actually are referring to the guidelines which they are pretty much aware of and giving you the violations that your interface design has made. So, from this we understand that UT, user testing and heuristic evaluation are completely different domains. One cannot be compared with the other based on these scenarios. Now, let us understand how to conduct a heuristic evaluation. The first and foremost part that you need to understand is you should know what to test and how, whether it is the entire product that means the entire concept that you have thought about or it is just one activity or one task or one procedure that you want to test. You need to clearly define the parameters of what to test and the objective of the test. Second, know your users and have clear definitions of the target audience's goals, context, etcetera. Now, user personas here can help evaluators see things from the user perspectives. Now, you must understand that while we will discuss the heuristics, these heuristics is contingent on the persona or the scenario based on which the interpretation is made. So, your experts must be aware of the persona, must be aware of the scenario, because it is from that perspective that they are going to use the heuristics and evaluate your UI design. So, it is pretty important for you to inform your experts and evaluators about the persona and the scenario based on which your concept is being delivered. Third, identify around 3 to 5 expert evaluators, ensuring that their experience in usability and the relevant industry are sufficient for them for you to gather deep insights about your UI design. Fourth, define the heuristics. Now, it might happen that you are focusing on a very highly customized product, it can be a B 2 C product, it can be a fintech product. Now, Nelson's heuristics are generic in nature, a lot of research has been done lately and then variations of Nielsen's heuristics have been defined for specific fields. You might like to use those specific heuristics that depends on the nature of the system, nature of the product and the nature of the design. Based on this you consider whether you are going to adopt all the heuristics or you adopt very specific set of heuristics based on the nature of the context that has been designed for. Fifth, brief evaluators on what to cover in a selection of tasks. Now, this means that suggesting a scale of severity codes to flag the issues, how much severe a particular violation is according to the expert that tells a lot about the issues that the interface guideline is being currently plagued with. Sixth, first walk through, have evaluators use the product freely, so that they can identify elements to analyze. Then consider the second walk through, evaluators scrutinize individual elements according to the heuristics, they also examine how these fit into the overall design, clearly recording all issues encountered. That is part of this second walk through. And finally, you are supposed to debrief your evaluators in a session, so that they can collect results for analysis and suggest fixes. Now, at this stage, you can also debrief them that there would be an observer who would be there for recording their verbalizations. Both approach are acceptable in heuristic evaluation format. Now, we are going to discuss about the heuristics 
based on which evaluators evaluate UI design and identify and flag the violators, the serious issues in your concept. Let us discuss about the heuristics in detail now. The first heuristic that have been provided to us by uh, Nelson and Mollich is about visibility of system status. Now, what does it mean? It means that the design should always keep users, your representative users informed about what is going on through appropriate feedback within a reasonable amount of time. See, first of all, consider that if you are in a particular location, if you are traveling to a particular location, you always look at the surroundings to at least have an idea about the space and the geography, so that you can create a map inside you for navigation. Now, that is how generally people navigate and search for location. Similarly, in the case of when a person is interacting with a web page or a software, he also needs to understand where he is located, where he is currently. Unless he understand his local position, he would not be able to move from point A to point B, because everything depends on him interpreting the current situation. So, the first heuristics allows us to understand whether the system status, where I am currently, at what state the system is in, do I have that information as a user from the interface that have been presented to me. So, therefore, as a designer, you must focus on designing those micro interaction aspect that we have discussed earlier. You must ensure that appropriate feedback is being provided to your user, so that these heuristics are not violated. The heuristics of understanding the state of the system, keeping the users informed about what is going on, where I am currently. This is called the state, status of the system. What is happening currently? If you understand the current situation, you can predict the next aspect. This is the principle based on which this first heuristics focuses on. Now, what we understand from this is that knowing what the current system status is can help users learn the outcome of their prior interactions and determine the next steps. This is called planning, because your users plan. You know, predictable interactions create trust. Trust is a very important factor for you to have, because that would ensure that you can create a loyal customer base in the product as well as in the brand. Now, some of the useful tips that you can focus on here is that communicate clearly to users what the system state is. No action with consequences to users should be taken without informing them. Present feedback to the user as quickly as possible once an activity is being uh, performed. Build trust through open and continuous communication. So, some of the example are you are here on the map. You can see very nicely designed map say that you are here. So, interactive map have to show people where they currently are to help them understand where to go next. This is about planning their next interactions. Check out flow, multi step processes show users which steps they have completed, they are currently working on which and what comes next, you know this is the state of the system. Phone tap, touch screen user interfaces need to reassure users that their taps have an effect often through visual change or haptic feedback. What, whenever you touch there is a response, there is a vibratory feedback, there is a sound. 
So, these are all ways to provide ensuring messages that the system is being responding based on the input that the users are giving and that allows the users to understand the status of the system, which would be eventually useful for being for them plan from where they have come, what currently where they are and where they can move on. Right? The second important heuristics is about match between the system and the real world. Now, we have uh, many a time we have discussed about this in detail during our initial lectures. You must understand the situation that uh, how do we make sense of a particular thing. Whenever we are confronted with the situation, whenever something new is, uh, is being presented in front of us, a new, it can be a new product, a new interface, how do we make sense out of it. If you relate to the discussions that we have during uh, cognition, you will realize that we relate meaning of uh, the present experience based on what we have stored from the past. That means, our past plays a major role for us to interpret the reality. So, the design should speak the user's language. Otherwise, he would not be able to comprehend from his past. You must understand what, what uh, cues have been stored in his memory, so that he can understand what is he being presented with. So, use words, use phrases and concepts familiar to the user, rather than internal jargon, follow up real world conventions, making information appear in a natural and logical order. That is that is obvious. So, the language you should use depends very much on your specific users. Some of the tips like ensure users can understand meaning without having to go look up for a word's definition. So, labeling has to be uh, done in a way that is relatable with their experience and with their uh, memory. Never assume your understanding of words or concepts will match those of your users. User research will help you uncover your users familiar terminology, that is what you can do in user study, you would know the terminologies, you know the abbreviations, you know the uh, uh, local terms that these people speak, they relate with and that essentially means that you actually understand their mental models around these important concepts. Some of the examples like stove top controls. So, when stove top controls match the layout of heating elements, users can quickly understand which control maps, which control maps to each heating element, right. We are, we, we are actually discussing about uh, the controls of your stove. By just interacting initially, you understand what you are controlling with, which one controls what car versus automobile. Now, if users thinks about this object as a car, use that as the label instead, right. The, the, the icon of car, do they understand this as a car or do they relate this with an automobile, with the word, the label, right. We are more familiar with the word car than the word automobile. Shopping cart icon, so shopping cart icon is easily recognizable because that feature serves the same purpose as its real life counterpart. These are some of the examples that let us understand about the second heuristics, which is about match between system and the real world. The third one is about user control and freedom. Now, users often perform actions by mistake. They need a clearly marked exit to leave that unwanted state or action without having to go through an extended processes. And when does it happen? This often happens when 
there is a gap between the mental model of the user and the conceptual model of the product. And that is what we call it as gulf of execution, if you remember the one that we have discussed in our last modules. The more amount of gulf the user has to take, there is high possibility or chance that he is going to commit an error. Now, it is obviously almost impossible to design a flawless and completely error free system, but then the focus should be that even if the user encounters an error, how does you provide him with support, so that he can come out of the situation without being getting distressed. Right. So, when it is easy for people to back out of a process or undo an action, it fosters a sense of freedom and confidence. And it is at that moment, there is a strong bond between the brand or the product and the user. Exits allow users to remain in control of the system and avoid getting stuck and feeling frustrated. Some of the tips are support undo and redo, show a clear way to exit the current interaction like a cancel button, make sure that the exit is clearly labeled and discoverable. Some of the examples that we see currently are this exit sign. So, digital space spaces need quick emergency exist just like physical spaces do. See, now we are trying to match between the real world and the system. Undo and redo, cancel button, these are some of the examples. Let us now focus on the fourth heuristic, consistency and standards. Now, users should not have to wonder whether different words, situations or actions mean the same thing, follow platform and industry conventions. See, the standards that we follow in interface design are governed by worldwide consortium guidelines. And these guidelines allows a clearly defined um, structure of how an interface needs to be designed. This has also been imbibed in the material design layout that we have discussed in the last module. Now, if you remember why it is important, if you understand the situation you would follow this consistency and standards throughout your design as well. Why it is important? Consider a situation like this. You have around 20 applications and just the search option or the search bar is in different places across the different applications. And therefore, for each application you open up, you need to figure out where this search bar is by an enormous amount of activity, by clicking this, by clicking that. Now, instead of this situation, if you have the search bar across the application, all the 20 applications at the same location, it makes the life of your user much easier. Because these are some of the global call to action features, which can be defined or placed in a way that is consistent throughout the entire gamut of Android or iOS platforms. Now, this is what we call as consistency as well as the way through which standards govern design of interfaces. Now, when, when we talk about standards, you must realize that each, pro, each application and each product caters to different areas and context. Some products can be educational products, some products can be fintechs, some products can be software as a service provider, anything. And each of these domains has their unique functions, unique features that caters to those domain only. These are also classified as something which is governing that specific standard or the specific context of the group. 
and you must follow this. If you are designing a fintech application and you are following the principles of a social networking site, then it might not help because your, your users are trained to look at these applications from a particular perspective because of your competitors who are following these standards across the industry. Similarly, while you design independent UIs of your application, if those UIs are not consistent in terms of layout, in terms of text, in, in terms of grid, then the user will not be able to relate each of these interface with the overall product or with the brand that you are being associated with. Therefore, it is important that you must follow platform and industry conventions. So, Jacob Nielsen's law states that people spend most of the time on products other than yours. So, failing to maintain consistency may increase the user's cognitive load by forcing them to learn something new. Now, this is a situation we are trying to avoid. So, what are the tips? The tips are improve learnability by maintaining both types of consistency internal and external, maintain consistency within a single product or family of products. For example, you have cars of a particular brand having consistency in terms of the design elements and cues that are being reflected across all their brands, all their product lineups. Then follow established industry conventions. Now, examples are check-in counter. Now, check-in counters are usually located at the front of hotels. Now, this consistency meets customers' expectations. Now, what will happen if you enter into a hotel and you start figuring out the check-in counter because it is not located in front, rather it is located in some other location. What will happen? Design systems, using elements from the same design system across the product lines lowers the learning curve of users. Notifications, a standardized notification design provides a similar but distinguishable look and feel for different app pop-ups. 